Hello, and thank you. I want to thank the Thrombosis Canada organizers for inviting me to speak today. The title of my presentation is Hormones and the Transgender Patient. These are my disclosures and more disclosure information and the mitigation of potential bias by the Thrombosis Canada organizers. So um, as way of introduction, approximately 25 million people around the world identify as transgender. Transgender patients have incongruence between their gender identity and the sex they're born with at birth. Transgender is not sexual orientation. In this presentation, I will focus on the binary designation of sex, uh, male versus female, although many people have non-binary gender identifications. Hematology providers and coagulation specialists need to know the medical aspects of transgender care and be able to deliver that care with respect. Many patients may not disclose symptoms, concerns, or even treatments that they are taking, especially if the treatments are obtained without prescription, if they do not feel safe to do so. Now, in this public survey uh, taken place in the United States uh, in June 2020, with over 1,500 self-identified LGBTQ persons in the United States. Uh, you can see that measures that were taken uh, to avoid uh, anxiety and concern are listed here. And one that stands out to me uh, is that almost 50% of transgender patients avoided going to a doctor's office uh, because of concern uh, for discrimination. Transgender individuals face unique obstacles to accessing health care, uh, including one in three who had to teach their doctor about transgender individuals in order to receive appropriate care. And you can see in this uh, continuation of the same survey uh, that the barriers faced by transgender Americans range from uh, almost 50 percent of uh, physicians being uh, visibly uncomfortable down to somewhere around 25% of doctors refusing to see a transgender patient. I'm going to start with a case. Case one today is a 44-year-old trans woman who had used the contraceptive estradiol 17 beta enanthinate uh, dihydroxyprogesterone acetophenide injections. These are not available in the United States and currently not available in many countries. Uh, but uh, these were obtained without a prescription and had been used for 16 years. Uh, the patient had stopped uh, two years ago after breast construction surgery. She now wants to restart hormonal therapy for overall sense of well being and to maintain feminine uh, characteristics. She is referred by an endocrinologist as her younger brother was recently diagnosed with a VTE after a car accident. The endocrinologist asked, should this uh, trans woman have thrombophilia testing and is it safe for her to take estrogen? So I'm going to start briefly with a, a dictionary of transgender terms. Uh, those that are male uh, gender assigned at birth but have a gender identity as female are known as transgender women or trans women. Male who, who remain uh, with male gender identity are known as cis men or non-transgender men. Females uh, who are born uh, with gender assigned at birth as female uh, and have male gender identity are known as transgender man or trans man. Uh, and cis women are uh, women uh, who may, were assigned female at birth and have female gender identity. Now, hormone therapy in transgender patients is used to achieve secondary sex characteristics. Hormone therapy is continued indefinitely, even if gender-affirming surgery is performed. And the goals of therapy are listed here. For trans women, men who are uh, transitioning uh, to female, um, they want to achieve female levels of estrogen and suppress testosterone into the physiologic female range using the lowest doses of hormones possible. For uh, trans men, uh, female transitioning to male, uh, we want to achieve and maintain physiologic male levels of testosterone. Again, physiologic and low uh, range of physiologic is what we are uh, aiming for uh, and not super physiologic levels. 
Now we know from uh, cis women taking combination estrogen, progestin, uh, oral contraceptives, that there are changes in the coagulation factors that lead to a prothrombotic state. Not only uh, is there an increase in the prothrombotic factors listed here, including uh, fibrinogen, von Willebrand factor, factor eight, but there's also a decrease in the natural anticoagulant factors. Protein S levels drop, and patients develop an acquired resistance to activated protein C, with this 40 to 60% decrease in protein S, coupled with an increase in factor eight, creating a relative activated protein C resistance. Inhibitors of fibrinolysis are, have also been demonstrated uh, to increase, and the sum total is an increase in uh, prothrombotic state. Now, when we look at uh, what different preparations of estrogens do uh, in postmenopausal women, uh, we can look at this study uh, that assessed differences in thrombin generation between oral and transdermal hormone replacement therapy. And you can see that there uh, were 52 controls, 52 women taking oral estrogen for hormone replacement, different doses than what we use for contraception, and 39 taking transdermal estrogen. And you can see in these thrombin generation uh, curves that the transdermal formulation has less effect on the parameters than the oral. So when we look at each of these graphs, the no hormone replacement therapy or the controls are on the far left, those taking oral uh, hormone replacement are on the middle, and those taking transdermal uh, estrogen preparations are on the far right. And you can see that in every aspect, whether it be lag time or uh, uh, peak thrombin potential uh, or uh, total endogenous thrombin potential, that the effects of transdermal uh, hormone uh, therapy are minimal and not significantly different uh, from those not taking exogenous hormones, whereas in every case, oral uh, estrogen uh, changes uh, the thrombin generation to a more prothrombotic state. We can also see uh, in this uh, study uh, just published this year that the effect of gender affirming hormone use on coagulation profiles in trans women looked at um, oral estradiol, uh, transdermal estradiol, and all as a, as a composite group and looked at um, both prothrombotic uh, and uh, natural anticoagulant changes. And you can see from these three different sets of graphs uh, with procoagulant changes in the red and anticoagulant changes in the green, uh, that when compared to baseline, uh, after 12 months of gender uh, affirming hormone therapy, there was an overall um, increase or, or trend favoring procoagulant changes uh, in these trans women. Now, estrogen is known to have an associated uh, uh, thrombosis risk, particularly for venous thromboembolism. Uh, and we can look at this table uh, with the relative thrombotic risk on the left uh, and the type of estrogen preparation on the right. Ethanol estradiol is the type used in combination oral contraceptives. Uh, and you can see that the VTE risk is associated with dose of ethanol estradiol uh, as shown on this color shaded uh, graph. Um, and that we, we, we no longer use conjugated equine estrogens in, in most situations. This has a moderately low uh, uh, risk for VTE. Uh, and we can see that oral estradiol, estradiol valerate, uh, a parenteral form not available in the US, uh, and transdermal estradiol have uh, low risk for thrombosis with transdermal estradiol uh, found to have the lowest risk of associated VTE based on the data in the publications I show below. So trans women who are transitioning, uh, we use estrogen to develop female characteristics and a, we use the estradiol formulation, an oral or transdermal form uh, is associated with the lowest VTE risk. And you can see in this data that the hazard ratio for uh, VTE uh, is 1.5 compared with cis men and 1.7 compared with uh, cis women in, in uh, male transitioning to female uh, trans women. Uh, we avoid the use of uh, ethanol estradiol because of the increased association with VTE. And uh, I wanna stretch stress 
that it's the hormone uh, replacement uh, therapy dose transdermal patch and not the contraceptive patch that's out there, which is itself associated with a significant increase of uh, venous thromboembolism above baseline. Now, what's unique about trans women um, from, from one study is that uh, unlike postmenopausal women, the VTE risk with estradiol may continue to increase over time uh, in trans women compared to postmenopausal cis women in whom the risk appears to decrease after the first uh, year of use. Um, when uh, we have trans women who are transitioning, we also want to suppress uh, testosterone. Uh, spironolactone is often used, and this has no associated VTE risk. Uh, a formulation not available in the United States or Japan, cyproterone uh, acetate, uh, is associated with a slight increase in VTE risk. Uh, but uh, more recent data suggests that even lower doses may be sufficient and are associated with a lower VTE risk. Uh, gonadotropin uh, releasing hormone uh, and are not uh, used uh, because of other uh, unwanted side effects. So for case one, we discussed the slight and minimal increased risk associated with transdermal hormone replacement therapy, dose estrogen, and use of spironolactone treatment uh, compared to cis women. We counseled on lifestyle VTE risks to avoid, uh, including obesity, smoking, and um, uh, patients, uh, no matter what uh, gender, uh, need to pay attention to cardiovascular risk factors in age. In this particular case, there was no need for thrombophilia testing. Uh, not only had this trans woman used 16 years of combination contraceptives with no VTE, but her brother's event uh, was caused by a strong provoking factor. Um, when we discuss trans women uh, and, and who are transitioning and, and newly starting hormone therapy, um, and they've had a history of VTE, uh, we have to keep in mind a couple, couple of factors about hormone therapy. In transgender patients, hormone therapy is associated with an improved quality of life for transgender patients. There are lower risks with oral or transdermal estrogen therapy and testosterone suppression compared to combination oral contraceptives, which had been used in the past. And these VTE risks are acceptable to many patients, even if they have a history of VTE. Hormonal therapy should be accompanied by continued use of anticoagulation if a patient experiences a VTE. So that a newly diagnosed acute VTE uh, uh, in a patient, uh, the patient can be started on anticoagulation and hormone therapy can be continued. Long-term anticoagulation for secondary VTE prevention can be managed uh, in patients um, by skipping doses to allow participation in contact sports if desired, and at other times uh, of increased risk of bleeding. And it is risk over time that we are using uh, secondary prophylaxis for. Case two is a 23-year-old trans man referred for evaluation of thrombotic risk. He had been using testosterone gel prescribed by his endocrinologist for two years. His 71-year-old grandfather was newly diagnosed with PE, which prompted a visit to his primary care physician and anxiety about hormonal therapy. His father and his sister aged 19 and his brother aged 25 had no VTE history. So when we look at um, the effects of testosterone, again, borrowing from what we see in cisgendered patients, uh, the testosterone effects in cis men um, showed from this, this uh, trial um, that the adverse events occur in older men with low testosterone treated with testosterone. Oh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna start over here. Uh, when we look at testosterone effects, we first start by looking at the testosterone effects in cis men. And in this study of the adverse events in older men with low testosterone levels at baseline, treated with testosterone to mid-physiologic levels, uh, we can see that there was no significant uh, increase in cardiovascular events, including myocardial infarction, uh, stroke, uh, or death from uh, cardiovascular uh, causes in those treated with testosterone compared to placebo. Uh, there were no differences in deaths, uh, hospitalization, or other adverse events. 
The only uh, abnormality uh, was an increase in hemoglobin uh, to seven, greater than 17.5 grams per deciliter in seven out of the 394 uh, participants taking testosterone, but this did not lead to an increase in MI, stroke, or death. Uh, the power, uh, the trial was underpowered to detect differences in adverse events, but it has reassuring numeric results. In the same study from uh, Shiraz and all, we now look at the effect of gender affirming hormone use on coagulation profiles in trans men. Uh, and again, similarly in those uh, on the left, trans men using intramuscular testosterone, uh, those using transdermal testosterone in the middle, and uh, the composite of, of all combined, looking again at the red dots, which are procoagulant change, and the green squares, which are anticoagulant change, um, after uh, getting baseline levels and then using uh, gender-affirming hormone therapy for 12 months, there is overall a minimal change in procoagulant uh, uh, levels and not uh, as significant as in uh, trans women. Other studies have looked uh, at the effect of testosterone on the hemoglobin and hematocrit uh, values in trans men. And in this uh, study, uh, 519 patients with pre and post hemoglobin and hematocrit values were assessed. Uh, and a, the mean peak hemoglobin was 15.7. Uh, and the mean hematocrit, uh, 47%. And it took, in some patients, you know, the mean time to peak of 31 months uh, so that we can see that there is a slight uh, increase in hemoglobin, but it, do it does actually plateau off. In this group, uh, less than 1% developed a BTE. Uh, two of these were superficial gain and two were caffeine DVTs uh, with one stroke. Um, this uh, also uh, shows the longitudinal uh, effect of testosterone on hemoglobin and hematocrit in trans men in over a thousand uh, trans men with 20 year follow up. Uh, and as can be appreciated, the largest increase in hematocrit occurs during the first year of use, and you can barely see uh, the zero takeoff uh, to an increase of hematocrit of about uh, 45%. Uh, in the first year. Now, in this uh, study, um, they found that the risk of an increased hematocrit was associated with smoking, an increased BMI, uh, long-acting undecanoate uh, injection preparations of testosterone, age at initiation of use, and any sort of pulmonary uh, condition, as could be expected. Uh, again, we see that once the uh, peak increases, there, there is very little uh, progressive accumulative increase over time, which is very reassuring. Trans men uh, who are transitioning use testosterone to develop male characteristics. There's no appreciable increased uh, risk of VTE. There's no increased risk of MI or stroke. Uh, and we do see an expected increase in hematocrit and hemoglobin. Uh, and in patients who have significant elevation, and I see this in my practice who, uh, in patients who have medical uh, reasons to have hypogonadism, we just decrease the testosterone dose uh, if possible to still maintain uh, the low end of the normal physiologic range, uh, but allow uh, the benefits of testosterone. We also, uh, in patients who have lifestyle factors that could be affecting hematocrit uh, and hemoglobin, uh, such as smoking and even obesity, uh, we try to modify those risks. This physiologic increase in red cell mass is expected in these patients, and there's no associated increase in VTE risk. And so case two, the patient was reassured that there was no associated increased risk of VTE with the transdermal testosterone preparation he was using. The lifestyle risks for VTE in general and cardiovascular events over time were discussed. The hematocrit was checked at 48% and the patient was very reassured. So um, in summary, um, in any patient, we need to assess standard VTE and cardiovascular risk factors, but particularly in transgender patients to basically relieve their anxiety and determine uh, who um, should not uh, receive uh, hormonal therapy. We try very hard to use uh, hormonal therapy when possible, 
using the lowest doses and the preparations with the least associated risk of thrombosis. Smoking is a known uh, VTE and cardiovascular risk factor, as is obesity. And I, I uh, put in the odds ratio for VTE associated with BMI uh, based on this study by Pomp uh, over uh, 13 years ago, uh, because many people are concerned about inherited thrombophilia, as was the endocrinologist uh, that referred uh, the patient in case one. The odds ratio for uh, developing a VTE based on a BMI greater than 30 is 2.4 which is essentially uh, what we see in patients um, who have heterozygous uh, prothrombin gene mutation. Um, almost 40% of the US population is obese. We should be addressing obesity uh, instead of uh, testing for thrombophilia. Uh, and with combination oral contraceptives, uh, the, the risk is increased significantly, but uh, combination oral contraceptives, as I've demonstrated, have a much higher risk of uh, thrombosis than estradiol preparations. Uh, we also assess personal and family history of VTE, lipid profile, uh, risk of diabetes, uh, or current presence of diabetes, and hypertension. And for all of our patients, we need to uh, consider the individual risk assessment profile for any uh, gender patient. So uh, care of the transgender patient um, is notable for limited data regarding hormone effects uh, in transgender patients themselves. Cisgender results are applied to transgender patients as these are the best estimates in many situations for coagulation profile effects. But we need more specific data on both the short and long-term risks of hormonal uh, treatments in transgender patients. The values and goals of hormone therapy differ in transgender patients. Stopping therapy is often not acceptable to the transgender patient, and patients are willing to accept the increased thrombotic risk or use of anticoagulation uh, to maintain uh, desired uh, effects of hormonal treatment. Caring for the transgender patient requires a multidisciplinary team approach, uh, particularly focused on cultural competency and respect and sensitivity. Uh, knowledge of available treatments is important, Understanding the differences uh, in goals of hormonal therapy between uh, cisgender and transgender is important, uh, and individualized risk assessment and shared decision making should be the norm for any gender patient. Uh, thank you for your attention, uh, and I'm happy to answer questions.